three, two, one. It's so important that we're seeing so many minority storytellers on mainstream platforms today. And it got me thinking, what exactly is the process of telling a story for your community? I mean, it's an incredibly personal experience. For some, it might be re-traumatizing. For others, it might be healing. For others, it might be both. And where do you start with that? What is it like when you put it out? How nervous do you get when you know your family's gonna see it? I have all of those questions for Minhel and more, so welcome to this episode of The Process. Um, I'm so thrilled and excited today because I'm just gonna say y'all are in for such a treat. This is gonna be a really provocative, incredible conversation. Um, Minhal is one of my favorite people to talk to, especially about the topics that we are going to be talking to you all about. Um, and I'll, I'll just go in by like how I know, how I know you. Do you know how, I think you do. Wait, well, do, do I? Wait, you Is have you? to know. Cause I'm like, such, I, I was like a really big fan. I got very, very excited when I found out that there was a Muslim woman rider on Bojack Horseman <laughs> and was over the moon. So um, my husband Adam and I are very big fans of Bojack and we're very big fans of watching people talk crap about the industry and uh, animation. <laughs> So it was, it was really amazing to see that, and we would just like follow along what episodes she was writing, and we really enjoyed that. Um, but now we're here to talk about like your, I feel like this is like your baby. Yeah. I would say. Um, and it's been such an incredible success. So like we are all so proud to see how amazing this is doing, but also the conversation that the movie Hala has been starting internationally. Um, but first I want to just start by asking you, like, how is your heart today? My heart? Your heart. I mean, honestly, as I was coming up here, it was like racing, mostly because the, about the conversation we're about to have. <laughs> um, but also just excitement. Like, it's been such a long time with this movie and this baby and, you know, finally having it out in the world has been very cathartic. And I think for people to finally be able to see the, the work I've been doing um, has been very validating. And um, I'm just excited to be here because I actually have to go back to work on Monday. So um, it's, I'm really excited to talk to you guys. My heart's just like, I don't know, I feel both vulnerable and uh, terrified at the same time. <laughs> Which is, I think, a good feeling. I think it's a great feeling. I think there's so much growth that happens in that feeling. Um, but your vulnerability in your work has not only touched me, but so many people. And when I was watching Hedda, I remember just thinking, like, I grew up in rural Maryland. And I thought, oh, from where? Uh, from where? Baldy. I was, oh, I grew up in La Plata. He said, oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I literally grew up thinking that my family was like the only Muslim family in America. And it sounds silly <laughs> to think about it that way. But if you think about like the actual representation of Muslim Americans in the media at the time, it was close to none, unless you were talking about the negative representation that was being shown on the news post 9-11, right? So, um, so I remember just like watching the film and thinking to myself, like very emotionally, I was like tearing up, that my 12, 13, 14 year old self would have never in a million years imagined sitting in a movie theater watching uh, a girl who was going through experiences that I would have related to. So for you during that process, what exactly did representation mean for the film? In the process, you know, I'm, kind of was in the same position as you where I didn't get to see those kinds of characters in film and television. Like the joke was that the families on TV were too well adjusted for me and <laughs> I wanted to see a better reflection of the fi family dynamic that was in my home in on screen. And so genuinely like the where this all started from was this 
you know, desire to see that and to really reflect, represent my life. Because so often I was trying to fit myself into other people's stories. Yeah. Like I would go to the theater and I would say, well, it's kind of like that. And it's kind of like this. And I would take things piecemeal. And what I was really missing was that feeling when people are watching in a, in a theater and they're like, this is, this is my life. And so Hala came from a place of that, like that feeling of wanting, you know, this, a young woman's coming of age who just happens to be Muslim and Pakistani American, and that's part of her life. Um, and it, I'm just gonna do my best for that story to be emotionally honest to what I experienced at that age. And it was really just that. And it, I, I realized it was more terrifying than I, you know, when I first set out to do it, when it actually came to doing it, it was putting things on paper that were really scary to read and to share with other people. Like I was actually embarrassed and ashamed. I had a lot of shame when I was growing up as a kid. And I knew that that, that shame was coming from a real place and it had to be confronted. So that was all the, you know, dealing, pro making the film was so much a way of processing that pain. When you first started, I would say in the writing stage, what was your intention when it came to who this film was and how did that change? Who it was for and how did that change? Originally, I was thinking, you know, I'm gonna make this film for the 18 year old who felt like the 16, 17, 18 year old me that felt very alone in her feelings and her struggle. And I'm gonna make that version, like if she were to see this, she would come away feeling like she's seen and understood and that she's not, that it's not hopeless um, and that there is another side to the, all of the, what she's going through. The coming of age is a universal experience. And then, so it felt very specific. And then when we shared the movie, at festivals, I realized that it had touched a wider group of people than I anticipated. Like I found people from all walks of life finding pieces of themselves in her story. And that surprised me because usually it was the other way around, me trying to find myself in their stories. And that was, that was like, honestly, it was a surprise. Like I, I didn't see, that coming from when, when I started making the movie. Was there a response that stuck with you where it was kind of like that aha moment of, oh wait, this is way bigger than me? There were, there were several moments, but the one that I remember the most was, there was a, a girl who wrote to me after seeing the short film, which preceded the feature, and it was a long letter. She had watched the film in secret at home, and she um, just wrote this long s story about her life, which was essentially that she grew up in a very culturally conservative home and felt like she didn't get to see a version of her struggle on screen and it, in a way that was humanizing. And she wrote at length, she's like, it's like you were peering into my life. I can't explain how you did that, but you did. And I've gotten messages like that since from the feature. And it, one of them, another one of them, that what has been really surprising about the film being global is that it's literally from almost everywhere, which has been kind of the shock was like, getting letters from people from like Turkey and Sweden and you know India and Australia and that sentiment being shared. That's incredible. Speaking of the cultural aspect, uh, something that we've talked about before and I think is really fascinating and that some people in the room may not be as familiar with is that oftentimes when it comes to misrepresentation of Muslim communities, the mix-up in the misrepresentation is a balance of religion and culture and the difference between religion and culture. And to be frank with you, there are a lot of Muslim families that also get that mixed up, the right. difference between religion and culture. Um, but one of the things that people who were 
uh, more critical of the film was that there wasn't any explicit explanation in that difference. Right. Um, but that decision for you was very intentional. So why exactly did you decide to do that? In writing the script, I just wanted it to feel very grounded and in her perspective as a 16, 17 year old girl. And I feel that even in the writing of those scenes, I just wanted it to feel like you're a fly on the wall watching these events unfold. And for me, the idea of hitting pause on the narrative and explaining to the audience that this is a religious conservatism or a cultural conservatism or this is a cultural belief versus a religious belief felt like I was then trying to be didactic about something in a way for a certain gaze. And I think that like the specific gaze, like the white gaze, the gaze that does not understand those differences. And I felt I, when I watch movies, the movies that I've loved the most, the, you are in on the ride with the characters and you're in on that with the artist. And sometimes you have to catch up and you mm -hmm. have to do the learning. And then that was like, I always just ask myself, is this honest to the scene and to these characters? Would they really say or do that? And if it was no, but it was serving this other purpose. It was, bec it was because I, the only reason to put it in would be to explain something to someone rather than being honest to the narrative. And so I would always turn back to the characters and ask myself, what would she really do? What would they really do? Um, and so it was very intentional. And there were times where people would read it and bring up that question of, is it this or that? And my answer would just be, you have to experience the film as a whole and understand that there are things that are complicated for you in the same way they are for the character. And that feeling of confusion um, is an intentional feeling not to make you confused about what Islam is or what you know, their cultural backdrop is, but to root you in the subjective experience that she's having. It's interesting because that is like such a common struggle with I think minority storytellers. How much of and, and sometimes like I, I know that I've even done this without realizing because we're so used to having to explain why we do certain things, why you dress a type of way, why you speak a type of way, why you pray a type of way. And it becomes so natural. So part of in, in front, as a viewer, part of the process and understanding how you were telling the story for you and for the community was that it was so authentic to the experiences that Hada was going through or that you may have gone through and that some of the viewers may have gone through. But how do, and this is like as a, as a storyteller as well, how do we balance that conversation in when is it the right place and time to do that and when is it the right place and time to have those deeper teachable moments where you are like, okay, like this is actually the difference here and we recognize that there is such deep history in misrepresentation right. and how do we work on alleviating that? I think that's a complicated question. I feel like whenever, every time a work comes out that represents a certain community or has features characters coming from a certain community, the community has a conversation. Mm. And I do feel that that dialogue is useful surrounding a work of art and engaging with people and really asking difficult and tough questions. Like I've, you know, had really intense but very fruitful conversations with people who have watched the film and come away with a very different interpretation, with a very different perspective than when they were coming in. And I find that when they sit down and really do that work of sort of engaging with the work and engaging with other people um, critically, that we can push forward in the kind of art that we can make and sort of open up the kinds of storytelling that we even expect from minority storytellers. Because there's also that expectation that's placed that only certain kinds of stories are okay. Exactly. And, yeah. Yeah, and I feel like that's that's something that you know we're all sort of reckoning with, in some way as storytellers, is like, 
how do we manage to keep pushing that this arena forward, like the space in which we can create these stories and the kinds of subject matter and the complexity that we can in, include in our work and in our characters. How do we balance that with the consistent tokenization that happens? Because I recognize, like, and I say this very openly and publicly, like, to I believe tokenization oftentimes is a requirement or prerequisite to a seat at the decision-making table because we're not going to wake up one day and just have that seat without having to break through barriers that have been put up so strongly before. But sometimes the tokenization feels consistent. What advice would you have to storytellers who want to alleviate that issue? That's something that is an ongoing struggle, <laughs> I think, for, for me too. But I think the way that I've found at least some solace is being able to talk about my work as part of a lineage of other work and the work of other artists and Muslim women, uh, Muslim artists, but also just in understanding that I am where I am because of the work that people have done before me and that there will be more people after me and that there has to be this effort to continue bring, bringing people up with you mm -hmm. instead of taking the seat at the table and then blocking anyone else who wants to be at the table. I think the goal is to include more people so that the tokenization goes away eventually. And I think that it's just hard because we're in this like pressure point where the demand is so great for the storytelling and the storytellers are just beginning to break through. Totally. Um, I have a friend who, who says like, being the first doesn't matter if there isn't a second or a third. And I think that oftentimes the first has to take a lot of hits uh, because sometimes you're doing things that make people uncomfortable, including people in your own community. And we've talked about this experience and a lot of, and if you've been following the journey of Hedda coming to Apple TV, maybe I've caught some of it, but when the trailer first came out, it created quite a stir and um, it, wasn't really representative of the story, but it came out and caused a lot of con conversation on social media. And unfortunately with social media, oftentimes um, we don't get to go past a first impression for a lot of people. Right. And I know that this has had a personal effect on you. You don't have Twitter anymore and you've shared yeah. a lot <laughs> on Instagram um, very vulnerably about your struggle with horizontal hostility and the reaction and trying to like reckon with the importance of having a story like this out there and people being on the defense without actually watching it. Like you said, people went in expecting something and then came out seeing something completely different. How do you, as a creative, deal with the uh, sense of horizontal hostility? And for people who are not as familiar with what that term is, it's the sense of hostility and strangeness that exists between people who share similar values and identities. Um, and how, I mean, I, I would raise of hands if you've ever dealt with that in your community where you have struggled with people <laughs> who have thrown shade or side-eyed you or subtweeted you because of, um, because you weren't Muslim enough for them or because you weren't whatever you identify with enough for them. So how do we, how do we deal with that? You know, there's, there's a great discomfort you know, but I also think that's part and parcel of the, of the work that I do, that the kind of storytelling that I'm interested in is a vulnerable storytelling, and it's a risk-taking that I understand now in a way that I didn't understand before this movie came out. I finally understand what it means when artists talk about being vulnerable and taking the real creative risk, is that you actually are terrified of... There is a real fear that you have to contend with. I think in terms of, like dealing with horizontal hostility. I think about what I can control and what I can do, and I try to lift other voices in my group instead of finding sort of ways to criticize them or bring them down um, or elevate myself at their expense. Like, I think there needs to be a more concerted effort to have a solidarity 
in the set, in in the shared goals of a community. Like if the if the shared goal is for greater representation, you don't have to like everything that comes out by someone who's you know from your community, but there is such a scarcity right now that at some point you hope there will be a volume at which we can have much more critical discourse in a way where we don't feel like we're silencing someone or telling them that their stories don't deserve to exist. Because I think that there is that fear of if your story doesn't check off certain boxes that you shouldn't make it. And I think that's really terrifying and something that I do see as a concern for other filmmakers, like having seen the very knee-jerk responses that can ha can sort of transpire on social media. Um, and like, I just, I try to think of it as, like you were saying, like you take the hits now, knowing that later on that the community sort of evolves and changes to accept and be more supportive of those voices. Like I think it's a very, it's a, it's a, it takes growth and it takes a lot of work um, for those voices to exist, to be nurtured, for that work to reach a large enough platform for people to access their work. All of that is going to take years and years, um, especially when it comes to Muslim representation. I think there's a very long way to go. Totally. When um when those conversations started happening, one, were they expected for you? And were they expected by Apple as a network supporting your work? And what were the conversations around the approach and how they were going to put the story out? For the response to the film, in some ways, surprised me and only that it was more of a response to the trailer. Like, I think that the response to the movie has been sort of what I, I has been like thankfully very warm. Um, but I think that was, that was the more surprising element was like realizing that people would take the trailer a certain way and that would be their first impression and, and perhaps only impression of the movie. Um, and in terms of like the way it was rolled out, like I think the most radical thing that Apple did with this movie was they gave a very small film that was entirely independent, you know, made independently a large platform to exist. Most of the movies that are going to festivals don't get this kind of distribution, especially not a film like this. So I think in terms of that, like I think that that's kind of unprecedented for this type of story to receive a large release, to be released globally in over a hundred countries. I think that's pretty special. I think in terms of like the marketing, like we're all still trying, you know, figuring out so much about how people respond to certain story elements and then sort of make presumptions about what the movie is as with any trailer for any movie ever. Right. Um, but I think in terms of like the ambitions, it's, it's, it's really commendable and I hope that there's, that this happens more, is that these kinds of stories get a larger platform because we have seen historically that they get very limited, tiny releases with really specialty distributors and then they disappear and no one's heard of them and you can't find them on VOD or streaming and they just go away. So, a lot of the reaction that came from the trailer was because of the storyline that it kind of seemed like the main character, I mean, it's a beautiful coming-of-age story, and with many coming-of-age stories, there is um, an underlying love story, and it came off as, like, the character's love story with this non-Muslim white boy and kind of finding herself in that, but when you watch the film, you realize that actually isn't the true love story, Right. Um, and that the love story in the film is that with Hada and her mother. Why was that so important to you to display as a main narrative? And why is it so important to your community that that was the story you were telling? I look back at that time in my life and I think about what are the most defining relationships. 
and it was definitely the relationship with my parents and especially with my mom because it was the real sort of struggle in my household was I was leaving home for the first time and going away to college, which is something that no young woman in my family had ever done. And that was like the source of great pain in our family is recognizing that I was gonna go do this thing sort of against their wishes and that we had to eventually reconcile and come to terms with that. And that was a very painful time in my life where I see how I was making assumptions about who, what, what my mom was thinking and why she did the things that she did. And I, when I started writing the movie, I was so in Hollow's Corner and I was always seeing my mom as like an obstacle to a goal. And then by the time, because it took five years for the film to get made, by the time I was done with the movie, I would watch the scenes with her and her mom again and I was totally with her mom. <laughs> And I realized that I had marginalized her when I was growing up. And in making this film, I was understanding her perspective and the way that she was a strong and assertive force in a way that I didn't appreciate or understand when I was 17. That touches my heart so deeply because I think I've been having a lot of conversations like this, but when it comes to understanding the stories of our parents or those who raised us or those who were around us when we were growing up, when you like become an adult, you see them as completely different people. And I'm going through that, I think, process now with my parents and realizing, you know, I live in a different state, I'm married, I have my own life. And you kind of realize, you know, your parents at one point were just like kids trying to raise kids too. And they were trying to figure it out too and oftentimes have so much healing to do themselves. And that conversation doesn't always happen. It often doesn't happen in first generation households because sometimes the parents don't realize that they actually do need healing. Um, and so we carry that kind of trauma with us for until you're able to see for yourself, oh, this is why I do the things that, that I do, or this is why I, I feel the way that I feel. How was writing this film a healing process for you? And in, was there any way that this was a healing moment for your family? Oh, I have a story. Yes, that. okay, that's so, why we asked. Um, I haven't, I've only told one other person this, but I'll, I'll get to that. Um, the, I think of the way of making the movie, the and I guess I was in some ways being ignorant and self-taught about filmmaking was doing, sort of figuring things out by trial and error, but also just like learning as I went on. And one of the things I learned early on were there in filmmaking and the process of making the short and then the feature were, was that there are certain things that make me deeply uncomfortable. Like, for example, like just writing a sex scene and directing a sex scene was extremely uncomfortable for me at every stage of the process. The writing of it, the directing of it, the editing of it, coloring it, sound designing it. And for a lot of people that may seem like, you know, why is this such a big deal? And for me, it was in my family, in my home, we never talked about these things. We never, I didn't get to see sex scenes in movies. I was deeply ashamed a lot of the time of my own sexuality. And so putting that into paper and then making a scene and writing and directing it and having to resolve for myself that cer certain things happen in my life and that I would have to contend with them in this movie for it to feel honest to this young woman's experience. I had to continuously approach the thing that I feared most. And it was only when I was on set and I was like taking a breath and realizing like this thing I'm doing is extremely difficult for me. For someone else, it might not be. That's not a specific pain that they're dealing with. But for me, it was extremely painful. And then coming out on the other side of it, it was just, I have to keep approaching the things that are scary, genuinely scary, not just the things in, in, that are an intellectual exercise, but like I had to like look, in my, like look inside of myself and see that I am really afraid of these things for a reason. And the only way that I can overcome them is to slowly approach them 
and then via exposure therapy, find a way to like resolve my relationship with them. And so in making the movie, I've resolved a lot of things that were extremely uncomfortable and difficult to talk about, including that, including sexuality, but also my relationship with my mom. Um, with my family, it's really interesting because my brother recently watched the movie and he's younger than me and the story is that I made the film in secret and no one knew what the film was about or when I shot it and they didn't see it at a festival. No one in my family did. And at Sundance, I did tell my mom that I had a movie at a festival, but I didn't tell her what it was about. And I'm slowly building up to telling her what it's about, but my siblings know what it's about. My sister hasn't seen it yet, but my brother on his own watched the movie. Your sister hasn't seen it yet till like today. Yeah, hasn't seen it yet. But my brother watched it and he sent me, this is how I found out. I was really late at night. He sends me a screenshot of my movie and I'm like, oh my God, he's watching the movie. This is so uncomfortable. Then he sends me a really long text and it was, he watched it and he said, I wa he said, I watched it and the parents in the movie are our parents. And um, it completely, it shocked me that he appreciated the movie, but also like that he, you know, my brother is a little younger than me and can be kind of immature, but it was interesting for him to see what Hala was going through. And he said that what she's going through is something I went through. And you captured what mom and dad were like, and it's really weird. And it just went on and on. And then he call, he was like calling me and I was like, it was like a hot potato. I was like, oh my God, I can't <laughs> talk about this right now. This is, cause I was like, my heart was racing. I was like, I've never talked to my brother about so much, you know? Yeah. And then I finally picked up the phone because exposure therapy. And <laughs> I, I call him and I'm like, hello? <laughs> and he's like, he just said, Minhal, you've done something extremely risky and like brave. Like, I think it's very brave that you did it. And um, I actually really love the movie and you captured our family. It was so surreal and like, honestly, just like completely took me out. Um, I don't know if that's healing, but it's it's the that's step. Def that's definitely healing. <laughs> <laughs> that's that is literally yeah. the definition. <laughs> yeah, that's in, that is so like. I'm not. I don't know if I should just respond to that because that's just beautiful, and amazing, and it's so clear that this entire process was so healing to you. Was there ever a transitional moment in which this went from your story to Hela's story? And in that moment, who did Hela become to you? She became, in the writing of it, because originally it was very one-to-one, -one, and then there was like the fictionalizing it, working through it. By the end of the film, I was very protective of her. Like, I wanted her to be okay at the end of the movie. Like, I wanted her to resolve this rift with her and her mother. I wanted her to not necessarily be at the end of a chapter, but be at the beginning of a new one. And I had a lot of hope in a way that I wish that I could have imparted to myself when I was 17 and I was going away for the first time to school and I was gonna be away for a long time and I didn't know that. Um, and so I, in some ways I was like telling the younger version, like, it's gonna be cool, it's gonna be fine. And it obviously is because <laughs> you're here today and have literally broken a barrier for millions of people and have opened, I feel like, so many people's eyes to a story, not only a story about you and so many others, but a story about people themselves. And I think that that's what a really great coming of age film does. So thank you for that.
Thank you. So we just wrapped up. It was really amazing and fun and emotional. And we got a story that hasn't been told before, which is always like the key highlight to these interviews. But a lot of that I think is because we like established that foundation of trust. And um, this room was like an incredible room to be in for a conversation like this because it's a room filled with other filmmakers, storytellers, people who understand the importance and the difficulties behind doing work like this. So I thought it was the perfect platform um, for a conversation like this. And we really hope you enjoyed learning the process of telling a story for your community.